We're Team FQ1, and today we are going to take a deep dive into the issue of government negligence of Adivasi peoples and how the government's unmindful actions led to the rise of resistance movements by Adivasi communities, as discussed in Arundhati's Roy's essay, The Greater Common Good. We're first going to provide a brief summary of the essay as a whole, and then move on to talk about the government negligence, and then a bit about the creation of the resistance groups as a whole, and then Finally, we're going to close off with um, a deeper dive into how these resistance groups progressed. I'm going to pass it on to the Vyesh to start it off to start us off with an overview of Roy's essay as a whole. Big dabs are to a nation's development what nuclear bombs are to its military arsenal. They're both weapons of mass destruction. They're both weapons governments use to control their people. I don't think there's a better line I could pick to describe Roy's views on dam construction and its effects on the people in the areas around the dam. Let's start off by understanding who Arundhati Roy is and what kind of writer she is. Arundhati Roy, born in 1961 in the town of Shillong, Assam, India, can be best described as an author, a political activist, and someone who has voiced several of her ideas on controversial issues dealing with human rights and environmental causes. She's best known for her novel, the God of Small Things, written in 1997, and later on in her career, she's worked closely with Meta Parker in the fight against the construction of dams along the Narmada River, and it is this part of her career that we're most interested in today. The Greater Common Good, written in 1999, is an article discussing the effects that dams can have on the people around them. Roy removes the sheets to show us the body, as she dives deeper into the problems, controversies, and the adverse effects of dams using the Narmada Dam project in India as her principal example. Her article covers issues that range from ineffective governing, to lack of planning, to ignorance and displacement of people from small villages. Her use of figures to back her claims is something that surprised me, especially after she criticized the Indian government for their lack of record keeping when it comes to matters like the number of people displaced by a dam. She goes on to talk about the role of the World Bank in the Narmada Dam project. In short, the World Bank was financing the project, but eventually pulled out when they realized that the project would be causing more harm than good. This would be the first time that the World Bank would pull out of any project that they are financing. Roy's use of numbers throughout the article not only makes her sound credible, but it shakes the reader, as they're simply unbelievable. Her constant use of metaphors to mock the Indian government shows her disappointment and anger, but further helps her stance on the irresponsible behavior shown by the Indian government. One quote that caught my eye from the Roy essay is shown on the slide here. It reads, the war on the, for the Narmada Valley is not just some exotic tribal war, or remote rural war, or even an exclusively Indian war. When I read this line, it made me feel as though I had moral responsibility to play my role in the fight for these people. It made me feel as though I needed to be a part of the Narmada Bachao Andolan. In all, Roy has a very good grasp on the topics she addresses, and does a fantastic job to make the audience feel as though they need to be a part of this fight. I'd now like to hand it over to Julia to talk about government negligence in Nixon's article. In Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor, Rob Nixon discusses Roy's works in his chapter, Unimagined Communities. Nixon discusses the narrative of a nation state and what exactly is meant by national boundaries and how communities are defined and determined in a way that benefits the government and bureaucracy. This discussion continues on to describe parts of Roy's article, The Greater Common Good, and the negligence of the Indian government and officials in protecting their people and the people's land. In the selected quote, Nixon describes the result of a combination of direct violence of physical eviction alongside indirect bureaucratic and media violence as spatial amnesia. Nixon continues on to describe how the government, as well as the bureaucratic system that holds power, seemingly ignores the demands and concerns of the people being affected by the changes they choose to make. This is important to realize in particular when assessing matters that have an impact on the environment, or in this case, their land. Oftentimes, people in power disregard how a project will affect their land in favor of the profit that will result. The premise of spatial amnesia, of spatial amnesia is especially important to keep in mind when reading The Greater Common Good by Arundhati Roy. In Roy's article, she describes the actions of the Indian government specifically focusing on the army, police, bureaucracy, and the courts. The fight against the Sardar Sarovar Dam brought into question the entirety of the political system and democracy of India. 
Despite the concerns and initial petitions made by the people, no changes were made until further protesting began on the larger scale. For the government of India, these dam projects were a means of emphasizing their power over the people, as Roy states in the given quote. The people who live in these project areas and who will inevitably be affected are disregarded. The pleas of the communities are forgotten and hidden under the guise that the continuation of these projects will benefit the country as a whole, when in fact the motivation behind their actions is simply authority. The emphasis on authority and power then transfers over to the government ideal of controlling the smaller villages and communities whose systems of power are more displaced from the centralized government. In the end, these obtuse changes result in the loss of culture and communities that have been a concrete part of the country for thousands of years, as represented in the quote above. Instead of focusing on preservation of these peoples, the government chooses to forget their importance, instead continuing with their projects. These unfaithful decisions then feed into a cycle of continued erasure of culture and environmentally detrifying projects. Since we've taken a look at how government negligence, government negligence negatively impacts the general population, let's take a look at how the continued ignorance led to the formation of resistance groups. On to Suraj. In her essay, Roy explains that the Indian government's ignorance to the impact of the raising of dams on the Narmada River on the common people of the river valley led to the formation of small localized organizations. Roy says these organizations promise, questioned the promise about resettlement and rehabilitation that were being bandied by the government officials. The constant ignorance of the masses in the name of national progress has led to the formation of these groups in areas threatened by submersion due to the raising of dams. As Roy reveals, quote, the various people's organizations massed into a single organization and the Narmada Bachao Andalan, the extraordinary NBA, was born. The people of this organization were notoriously known for doing anything it took to get what they wanted from the government. Roy enumerates many instances of protests from the NBA throughout her essay. In some instances, people were ready to drown themselves or starve themselves until their voices were heard. It really isn't hard to see where these people are coming from either. Their fertile farmland, their livelihood, had been washed away by the raising of dams. These people have been harmed more than they have benefited from the raising of dams on the Narmada River. The scale of the impact on Adivasi populations is discussed by Ramachandra Guha and Juan Martinez Allier in their book, Varieties of Environmentalism, published in 1997. Guha and Martinez Allier argue that, quote, the cost of the dam will be disproportionately borne by poorer peasants and tribal communities. From this, we can see that the villagers will not get any benefit from the dams whatsoever and will actually cause them a lot of harm. The ends to which common people are willing to do to go to get publicity on the issue at hand is put into perspective by this disproportion. This provides us more insight into the formation of groups like the NBA that represent the general public. These groups are formed out of necessity. If the people do not create ruckus, their voices will never be heard and they will continue to be negatively impacted by projects such as dam construction in the name of national progress. In essence, the lack of consideration for the well-being of common people is what led to the formation of resistance groups. Having understood how these organizations form, let's look at how they work in action. I'm going to pass it on to Maya. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the insights offered by Roy's essay and Sanjay Cox's 2002 film, Words on Water, regarding the development of resistance movements to the Narmada Dam project. Words on Water documents the Narmada Dam conflict and serves as a visual aid that supplements Roy's essay. While Roy's strength is in a rational argument against the dam, using data, Cox's film provides a more emotional appeal. A strength of the film is highlighting the experiences of Adivasi people that have been displaced by the dam project. While both Roy and Cox expose these Adiv this Adivasi suffering, Cox's film is often more effective in its portrayal because the medium of film allows for audiovisual depictions and real testimony from affected people. Cox focuses greatly on filming resettlement sites and letting Adivasi people share their stories, as seen in these still shots from the documentary. Many say that the resettlement land that they received is infertile, that not enough land was given, or that none was given at all. It is this government failure, as Suraj previously explained, that led to the formation of a resistance movement, the NBA, or the Narmada Bachao Andalan. In 1988, the NBA announced that their goal was to end the Narmada Valley Development Projects. Since then, the NBA has carried out numerous demonstrations against the dams, 
many of which are captured in Words on Water. This shot from the film depicts an NBA protest at the Narmada Dam construction site, which culminated with police detaining protesters. Other demonstrations featured in the Koch film include protests at the Ministry of Water Resources in New Delhi, at the Supreme Court of India, at the U.S. Embassy, and at the World Bank headquarters. NBA members have also stayed in homes as water levels rise as a brave act of nonviolent non resistance. Roy also writes about numerous MBA demonstrations in her essay. She, men she mentions one crucial protest that occurred in 1990 in Furqua. It culminated with a hunger strike that lasted 22 days and eventually caused the World Bank to drop out of the Sardar Saravar Dam project. When comparing Roy and Cox's works, it is once again evident that the audiovisual medium of film gives the audience a better idea of the scale of these protests and the passion of the protesters. After many demonstrations, the NBA has achieved some success as foreign investors have pulled out of dam projects in India. However, dam construction was still supported by a Supreme Court ruling, and dams on the Narvada continue to be built with government funding. In this quote, quote, Roy details that the movement is tiring and struggling to get media attention. Meanwhile, dam construction continues along with the displacement, and that is the state of the movement today. In summary, a movement that started out of the desperation of displaced Adivasis has grown, intensified, and continues on as dams continue to be built. Many movements like this have been born out of a government's reluctance to listen to the voices of its citizens in the name of national progress. These only grow in strength as people's voices continue to be ignored, and a prime example of this is the NBA as described in Roy's essay. That concludes our analysis of Adivasi resistance to large-scale dams as covered by Arundhati Roy in The Greater Common Good. Thank you very much for tuning in.